Picture a courtroom. The lawyers are opening their briefcases, ruffling through their notes, getting ready to present their respective arguments in the case of the people of the state of California versus BP, ExxonMobil, Shell, ConocoPhillips, and Chevron, the five largest oil companies in the world, responsible for at least 11% of all global carbon emissions since the Industrial Revolution. As the judge enters and takes his seat, a hush falls over the onlookers in the gallery. <clears throat> the case should be a slam dunk. But the judge dismisses the suit. Not because the climate crisis isn't real, all are in agreement that it is, and not because the defendants aren't key contributors, all are in agreement that they are. Instead, in his opinion, the judge writes, our industrial revolution and the development of our modern world has literally been fueled by oil and coal. Without those fuels, virtually all of our monumental progress would have been impossible. Would it really be fair to now ignore our own responsibility in the use of fossil fuels and place the blame for global warming on those who supplied what we demanded? In other words, we're all invested. We've all benefited. We can't just throw these companies under the bus, can we? Not after all they've done for us. All that they're still doing for us. Look at what we've built together. Perhaps this is what the proud denizens of Atlantis thought as their fabled metropolis was swallowed up by the sea. Which raises the question, what determines whether we're psychologically prepared to go down with the ship or to strike out for more solid ground? Deep at the bottom of the ocean, amongst the wreckage of doomed vessels and stoic seamen, lie the dragons of sunk costs. The secrets they guard may determine our fate. These are the dragons of climate inaction. Their habitat is in our minds, and this podcast is your field guide. Welcome to chapter six, Relatives of the Deep. This is Scales of Change, a field guide to the dragons of climate inaction. Join us as we learn to spot them in the wild and discover how they can be disarmed. Produced by Future Ecologies on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wusainich peoples, with support from the University of Victoria. Welcome back. I'm Adam. And I'm Mendel. And we're here with Robert Gifford to uncover the secrets of the Dragons of Sunk Costs. And if this whole dragon thing isn't making sense to you, check out our introduction to this series, entitled A Theory of Change. Okay, if you're ready, let's dive right in. Sunk costs is something I learned about because I never even took Economics 101, uh, but that's an economic concept. Once I own something, it tends to prevent me from doing something else. That sense of ownership can manifest in any number of ways literal and figurative. That's why we've named this dragon genus Precium, after the Latin root for price. The most straightforward form of ownership in our society has its mirror in the dragon of financial investments, Precium Pecunia. So the obvious one, which is not by no means the only one, is, say, owning oil stocks. So I have a colleague who owns a bunch of oil stocks, and so because of cognitive dissonance, it's hard for him to also think that climate is a big problem because there's a tension between these two things. And so what we say in the cognitive dissonance literature, it's easier to change your mind than it is to change your behavior. So in that case, what happens is uh, I change my mind that climate change is not important as opposed to what's a little bit harder, that is sell my oil stocks. These kinds of financial entanglements can influence our behavior. They're the reason politicians and judges are expected to recuse themselves from decisions that may affect their personal investments. 
The dragon of financial investments operates at a societal level too. It's one of the reasons Southern landowners in the United States were willing to go to war and die in the 1860s to preserve the system of chattel slavery that their whole economy was based on. Canadian journalist Andrew Nikiforak actually makes a compelling argument that our economic structures haven't really changed that much since the 1860s. Wealthy countries have just substituted fossil fuels for human bodies as a new form of what he calls energy slavery. And as you heard in the judge's decision in our introduction, that was a, a real judge in a real case, by the way, we're just as wedded to this form of energy slavery as the antebellum South was to its own. The point is, you don't by any means have to own oil stocks in order to be invested in the fossil fuel economy. The, the less obvious example than owning oil stocks is just owning a car, because it's like, well, why should I take the bus if I have a car? Uh, it kind of it doesn't make any sense. This thing is depreciating. Uh, I'm paying insurance on it. And then you want me to go on the bus? Uh, so there's different kinds of sunk costs, uh, and they're not all directly financial. Consider, for example, the dragon of behavioral momentum, precium impetus. I like to think of this one as the dragon of inertia. Well, I should, it should be called lack of behavioral momentum, shouldn't it? But I, I think you're right about that. But, but just habit. Basically, as we've discussed in past episodes, we're largely creatures of habit. And those habits are a form of behavioral investment that can be very hard to overcome, as anyone who's ever made a New Year's resolution will know. It's not an exciting dragon. It's kind of the dragon over in the corner that's bored and boring to look at, but is one of the biggest dragons in the, in the, in the pride. So we're going to move on to something a little more exciting. Our next dragon, conflicting goals and aspirations. Beyond financial and behavioral investments, our deepest investments are often in the stories we tell ourselves and others about our lives, where we're from and where we're headed. For most of us, at least those of us who aren't Robert's mules, we aspire to more than just mitigating global climate change in our lives. And often these other aspirations conflict with climate action. We legitimately have other things in our life that are important. We want to take care of our health. Uh, we want to take care of our children. We want to have a nice place to live. We want to do a good job at work. And so these things are legitimate goals, but sometimes they're used as an excuse to not do things for the climate when it is still possible to do, to make room to do something for it. A really basic example for us is the conflict between wanting to reduce our carbon footprints, but also to make the best podcast possible, which means actually getting out there in the field, talking to folks in person, and taking you, our listeners, along for the ride. And it's so easy to just use the podcast itself as a justification to, say, travel to California, or to Haida Gwaii, to get that good tape in person. It massively increases our carbon footprint, but those ends, they justify the means, right? As Robert has said previously, we're more a rationalizing species than a rational species. When our top priority is uh, the safety of our children, it's easy to rationalize driving them around in a big old SUV to reduce collision damage, even though it may not be necessary or to take that far off vacation, because we really do work so hard and probably deserve it, right? In this way, we can give ourselves a nearly endless license to consume energy and resources. If we can afford it. By just framing that consumption within a set of highly justifiable priorities, like health or safety, stress reduction, career goals, or even trying to make a podcast to help spur climate action. But as Robert said, it doesn't have to be either or, so we split the difference for this series by doing our interviews remotely and still going out into the field, but keeping it really local. And we just hope that for all of you listening from beyond the Salish Sea, there will still be a lot for you to take away from all this. It's our 100-mile podcast diet. And staying local has allowed us to focus on one of the most challenging dragons of all, Precium Dissociotera, or 
the dragon of place attachment. We're going to spend the rest of this episode focusing on place attachment, or the lack thereof. When Robert first explained this dragon to us, it seemed really straightforward. If we have a strong relationship to place, we're more likely to want to protect that place from environmental harm, more likely to notice the effects of the climate crisis that are already impacting the places we love. And reciprocally, if we move around a lot, or don't really have a strong connection to place, we might not notice the world changing, or really care about what happens to the places that we live in. You know, if it's my nest, I want to make sure it's nice and uh, clean and looked after. If it's not my nest, I'm kind of a cuckoo bird who lays eggs and lets somebody else take care of it. As one for your biologist there. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll take it. And the metaphor is actually more apt than it appears at first. Because as we're about to discover, the idea of place attachment is so much more complex than just we care or we don't care about the places we live in. It touches the deepest parts of our emotions and our identities, perhaps even our languages. Which is why Robert directed us to a subject matter expert. Yeah, this one is should be credited to my former PhD student, Leila Scannell. She's the, the global expert on place attachment, and I'm just the hanger-on, or the supervisor, or something like that. And through the power of podcasting, here is Leila. So my name is Dr. Leila Scannell, and I am a researcher, um, environmental psychologist, and I've studied uh, place attachment in various different contexts. Starting with the basics. Place attachment is a strong emotional connection between an individual and their important environment. So it's emotional, it's a cognitive, um, it's a behavioral connection between an individual and their important place. And that important place can take many forms. The literature says some of the most common places we become attached to are places of residence. It may be a childhood home, places in nature. That's very common as well because we know that nature offers us certain psychological benefits and so that we're more likely to be attached to those types of places. I think most of us have at least one place that has this special emotional attachment to it. Whether we return to our childhood homes in our dreams or fall in love with a particular ecosystem, or, you know, just spend all of our lives in the same community. So far, so good. But here's where it gets complicated. We knew from speaking with Robert that the longer we stay in a place, the more attached we're likely to be to it. One thing we know about place attachment is, by and large, one of the main factors is that people's place attachment grows with the length of time that they spend in one place. They get to know it better, they become familiar, they begin to identify with it. And so one of the reasons that place attachment is related to more positive attitudes is simply the length of time that you spend in a place. And from there, you can infer that the less time we spend in places, the less attached we are to them. And the less attached we are, the more likely we are not to notice or care about environmental degradation. That's true. The, you know, what the, the average length of time people spend in the same place is shrinking uh, by the year. Uh, and so that's creating less and less place attachment in general because, the, not surprisingly, the main predictor of place attachment is length of residence in a place. It's not the only one, but that's the, the, the key predictor. So the more uh, we're a migratory society, the less place attachment and then the less care about, uh, about that environment. And I think this rings as intuitively true to many of us. I've personally moved dozens of times in my life from Florida to Ontario, California to British Columbia, and I've just now finally chosen a place to put down some roots and try to practice place attachment as a form of climate action. So the idea of a highly mobile society losing that place attachment makes a lot of sense. But when we spoke to Layla, something much more unsettling came to the surface. But I wouldn't say that lack of place attachment is a problem in society. In fact, oftentimes I think that people are so strongly attached to a place that sometimes that can be the problem. She took Robert's dragon and flipped it completely upside down. 
Yeah, so it could be somebody's totally disconnected from a community, they don't care, or they're disconnected from the natural environment, and so in that sense they don't have motivation to protect it. Or it could be that they're very attached to the place and they want to keep using the place in the same way. Um, so for example, I'm from the Kootenays, there's a little lake called Christina Lake and there's a lot of boaters that go there every year. And that for them being attached to Christina Lake means boating. But if everyone's boating on the lake and you know creating the negative environmental impacts of that fun behavior, then that could be a way of harming the place that they're very attached to. So strong place attachment can be a barrier in, in a way, as well as not being attached and being disconnected from a place. Layla's research has dug deep into the effects of place attachment on climate action. And her results show that there is a positive relationship between place attachment and caring about the climate. But it really depends on what we mean when we say place. So I looked at two communities in BC, uh, Nelson and Trail in the Kootenays. And in both communities, being attached to the natural environment is associated with more pro-environmental action. But only in one community, being attached to the civic aspects of that community is associated with more uh, pro-environmental behavior. And that is being attached to Nelson, which is just, it espouses environmental values in terms of its identity. And in Trail, they have different goals and different things that they're focusing on. But it's industry, it's uh, lifestyle, it's sports. And so, you know, you can be very attached to both places, but it has a different outcome in terms of environmental behavior. This is where place attachment collides with worldviews to produce a major barrier to positive environmental change. So there's two, there's two dragons there, I guess. There's the one that the disassociation one, however you frame that. And then the other dragon is one that it's kind of like, um, it's very it's a defensive dragon. It's like, um, don't, don't touch my dragon cave. This is how I want it the way it is. Don't change anything. So they're different. I think they're different dragons. I believe we've just witnessed the hatching of a new dragon. Deep attachments to place become parts of our identity. And if our collective notions of place are more civic than ecological in nature, that can radically alter the outcomes of that attachment. So for example, let's say that you're attached to the idea of a place called America. From sea to shining sea, you know? Liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness. This was all drilled into me as a child, anyway. And if you're really attached and protective of this idea of this place, then you might view any major social change as a threat. We're seeing this play out with COVID-19, which has forced countries all around the world to radically change, almost overnight. And suddenly, you have folks coming out of the woodwork, making truly unhinged arguments that only makes sense if you take into account the power of the dragon of place attachment. People like the Lieutenant Governor of Texas, Dan Patrick. I have to apologize for this ahead of time, but here he is on Fox News. Uh, I'm living smart, listening to the president, the CDC guidelines, like all people should, but I'm not living in fear of COVID-19. What I'm living in fear of is what's happening to this country. And you know, Tucker, no one reached out to me and said, uh, as a senior citizen, uh, are you willing to take a chance on your survival in exchange for keeping the America that all America loves for your children and grandchildren? And if that's the exchange, I'm all in. Oh my God. So that phrase, the America that all America loves is doing a lot of work here. Yeah, he, he's basically arguing that seniors not to mention other immunocompromised folks, might be willing to forego social distancing and risk a painful, lonely death to preserve the idea of America that he's talking about. Which the cynical side of me would just say is the settler colonial capitalist economy wrapped in a flag. But if you listen to him, I know it's impossible to say for sure with politicians, he seems genuinely concerned, right? Um, and that doesn't make me noble or brave or anything like that. I just think there are lots of grandparents out there in this country, like me, I have six grandchildren, that what we all care about and what we love more than anything are those children. And I want to 
you know, live smart and, uh, and, and see through this, but I don't want the whole country to be sacrificed. If only he and these other grandparents could see the well-being of their grandchildren as actually being tied to the climate. I mean, the, the logical endpoint of this horrible reactionary version of place attachment is a toxic blend of nimbyism, nationalism, and sacrifice zones. Speaking of sacrifice zones, I, I kind of get the feeling that Dan Patrick would sacrifice the entire planet to protect his notion of the America that all America loves. And that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make. Place attachment is a serious double-edged sword. If we don't have enough of it, it's a definite barrier to climate action. We don't care. But if we have a lot of it, the question then becomes, what is the nature of that place attachment? Different cultures can perceive place in radically different ways. And I think the cuckoo bird that Robert brought up earlier is actually a really disturbing metaphor for the settler colonial mindset that is so tied to the climate crisis that we're in. Like this bird has evolved to lay its egg in another bird's nest. And when that egg hatches, it displaces and destroys all of the other eggs that were already in the nest and takes all of the food and space for itself. Yeah, it's pretty dark. And that's just how the cuckoo bird evolved. It's one life strategy among many. But we have a little bit more agency in our own evolutionary trajectory. And not all cultures have such a cavalier relationship to place. Which is why, earlier this year, I tagged along for a day with a truly inspiring group of youth and elders here in the Salish Sea. What were they up to? Well, when I found them, they were pulling out an invasive species here called Daphne, which is actually really toxic. Like, you don't want to touch the sap. Harder than it looks. <laughs> get this out of here. The group was part of something called the... Okay, I'm going to try this. <laughs> Tletleches Climate Action Project. And what is that? So we were on an island called Pender Island here in southwestern BC. But that's not this island's only name. This is also the traditional territory of the Hosanich people. And in their language, which is called Senchathan, the name for Pender is Stays. This group was there for this totally unique five-day field course organized by a local nonprofit and the Hosanich Leadership Council. And it was actually a mix of people who live on Stays and people who came from elsewhere to be a part of this, also Hosanich people. The first person I spoke to her name was Josephine Henry, and she's a Hosanich educator. She told me that it was learning her language that brought her out to the land that day. Yeah, I'm um, fortunate to be uh, learning myself. I'm learning Central. That's how I became involved, and that's how I'm here, and that's where the teachings and the language, you know, like that. I'm learning all of the, about, you know, this place and other places through the language. So it started with, with language for you. Yeah, and then... And um, here you are removing Daphne. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a rabbit hole. Feels awesome. In a nutshell, the project is based on the Hosanich teaching that the creator, Hales, cast out stones from a mountaintop on Vancouver Island. And these stones became the Gulf Islands, or the Tlatleches. And the Hosanich were given the responsibility to look after these islands. These islands are our villages, our assorted villages spread out all across um, our territories um, are um, teachings that have been handed down to us from Chels, our creator, um, to protect our relatives of the deep, the, the, the Leiches, that's what uh, Leiches means, is relatives of the deep. Relatives of the deep. I, I can see that you'd be more inclined to protect these islands if you think of them literally as members of your family. In the creation story of these islands and of these places, that's what he foretold as he, you know, after, upon creating them, so protect Quantat and Stjelacha. They're supposed to, meant to protect these places, our other homelands, all of our homelands, as they were our relatives of the deep. So, so they just, and so I'm here. 
Yeah, doing your part. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. Getting this daddy out. <laughs> yeah. Get Mine, can I give it a tug? Yeah, go for it. See if we'll come out. Ah. Ah, I can't keep my distance from this stuff. It's. Yeah, look at that. Woo! Yeah. Sounds like you two are really getting to the root of the problem. I couldn't resist getting my hands dirty. But yeah, the the root of the problem is displacement, right? And that sense of displacement was also felt by the non-Indigenous folks there, who were, in some cases, getting to know the places they already loved in a completely new way. All right, what's your name? Nadia. Nadia, why are you here? Uh, I'm here because I was born and raised here on Pender Island, and I didn't learn anything about uh, the Wasayich history of this place throughout my whole childhood. And it's almost like the course was designed for somebody with Nadia's background. I mean, I used to be more of a climate activist in the sense of advocating for particular carbon reduction limits and that, and I, I still think that's, of course, absolutely critical, but... Uh, I think over time, I've learned more about how the colonial regulatory system works. And now I see the future in like the revitalization of Indigenous governance and laws as climate action. And this is why she was out pulling Daphne that day. The land we were on is a Hussainich reserve, bordering what is commonly called Bedwell Harbor. And it's literally right next to this upscale resort called Poets Cove. The indigenous history of this place in particular, the Bedwell Harbor area, but Pender in general was essentially erased from my understanding of this place um, for my whole life. Uh, I took swimming lessons at the pool here at Bedwell Harbor as a kid. And my first ever job when I was 13 was cleaning rooms at the resort. And my mom was doing the bookkeeping. and, And I continued to work at Poets Cove for a number of Summers after that, I remember Poets Cove being constructed after they demolished the Biddle Harbor Resort. And I still didn't know the Indigenous history. And maybe there were folks talking about that at the time, but I wasn't hearing it because I was a teenager and I was just, you know, self-absorbed, doing my own thing, right? And so now uh, learning, like actually sitting with Wasanich elders, telling their stories of this place and the pain that still they still experience as a result of their communities and their people being removed from their stories and their histories has been really moving for me. Yeah, so I have a lot to reflect on and think about. You know, I get the sense that, like, Nadia, growing up in a place like this, she she would actually be the kind of person who would have some serious place attachment to places like Poets Cove and Bedwell Harbor as they are today. You'd think, right? But here she was, trying to undo some of the damage and learn to look at the place differently. The thing is, the Hussainich were forcibly removed from these islands, and Poets Cove is actually built on top of a Hussainich village called Quenquenu. It's really messed up. Village sites in this part of the world often include these middens, which are filled with remains of what people were eating, but also human remains. And when the building crews excavated to build Poets Cove, they actually just took all of those remains and dumped them unceremoniously on the Hosanich reserve lands. So later, when we gathered around the fire to eat some salmon that they'd been cooking there in the traditional way on these long skewers, Hosanich hereditary chief and residential school survivor, Eric Pelkey, talked about what it was like to go through that soil. And uh, actually, uh, 40 sets of remains they found there. And uh, it was pretty heartbreaking for them. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what all this dirt is here, you see. So it's a pretty heartbreaking thing to see, and it's a constant reminder to us when we come here that that is those are the remains, the dirt that was removed from the the excavation site when they expanded this this hotel. 
and our people had to come and sift through that to, to find those remains. So that that is that is what this land really uh, really means to us. This is our old village site, and uh, so it really really means a lot. And that's just one village site. The Hassanich people they they lost so much more than that. We. We had a permanent camp down in, in uh, Pender Canal that belonged to our family. Mm-hmm. It had been used, used continuously. And then it was turned into a park. And our people were told they couldn't, couldn't camp there anymore. They couldn't uh, harvest there anymore. So, you know, that really, really broke their heart. As I was a, a young man, I remember our people used to come out here and climb dig and hunt deer. That's so painful. And I'm sure there are settlers who now know Pender Canal as a park and have formed their own place attachments there. Totally. But if the length of time you're in a place is related to the depth of attachment, then the Hassanich relationship is just on a whole other level. Here's Leila Scannell again on the power of historical connections. Time is also related to ancestral ties. So if we have generations of families or if we have cultural ties to a particular area, we're more likely to be attached to it. Right. And and so the loss of it would just cut that much deeper. It's very common that people express grief as a result of those place changes, that they can't use the place in the same way. They, they can't connect to the place. Um, they've lost this continuity to the past. They've lost the social ties that go with this place. So yeah, there's grief and there's um, a lot of reasons for that when places are changed or lost. I heard a lot of grief that day. But I, I also heard a lot of hope. Because a huge part of this project is reconnecting with place. And I mean, here they are, right? Despite everything, still caring for these lands. And also making space for settlers to participate and learn. That's how strong the relationship is. But how can a relationship, even a strong one, survive such a violent displacement? The thing that kept coming up again and again was the role of language. It didn't really sink in until I was on the ferry back home later that evening. But luckily, our associate producer, Simone Miller actually attended one of these courses herself a couple weeks later, and she got to sit down with some new friends and really dig into the conversation. They were actually staying at Poets Cove for that course, and so Simone had to improvise a little bit. We're also, we're in the employee's room right now in the hotel, so there's a element of Risk, risk, here. yeah, risk kind of spicy. Yeah, there's spice. Hoping there's no cameras. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The I feel like right they'd be here by now if they. If they <laughs> <can't> <laughs> it sounds like a covert operation. I guess so. Anyway, here's Peter. Yeah, um, it's Guichel. My name is Peter Underwood. Yeah, I I work at the University of Victoria, and I'm here at the Tlatechis Field School. And this is Sarah a Hassanich visual artist and restorationist with the Sneak With Resiliency Project. Sarah Jim Thunet Snet, Chasala Sin et Hussainich, Chasala Sin et Hussaikum, Eilalang. So I just introduced myself in Sinchathan and I just learned how to do that the other day, which is really exciting. So it's not as fluent or fluid as it should sound, but it's practice. I mean, that sounded fluid enough to me. So what what is the relationship here between language and place? Well, at, at the most basic level, there are place names. And when Simone asked Peter about place attachment, Peter referred to a place that's called Clover Point, after a delightful plant that used to grow there called Springbank Clover. It's a pretty well-known spot in the city of Victoria, British Columbia. So yeah, uh, at Clover Point, there's no more Springbank Clover, so that kind of defeats the name, of, the purpose of the name of it being called Clover Point. The same thing happened with like um, so many Sinchathan place names. Sinchathan is the uh, 
is the language of the Wasanish people. But a lot of the Sanchathan place names are, they no longer hold the same meaning because the name usually includes what is in the place, usually like a plant or an animal. And a lot of those places no longer have that unique feature anymore. Uh, there's a river, a creek, I guess more, like a small creek nearby uh, Sneakwath, which used to make a special sound, and it was named after that special sound. The The name of that little creek is called Wachachacha, because uh, it describes the way that the water would run over the rocks there. But after some of the blasting that's been done there, it doesn't make that sound anymore. So it almost shouldn't even have that name anymore, which is really sad. Yeah, so I think bringing up a lot of those place names and how we've change the environment so much that they don't even hold like the the meaning the purpose of the place is really huge in how we kind of attach ourselves to these places too in english these names aren't related to the place even some of them are like beaver and elk lake but some of them are just named after colonizers like people who so-called discovered the land or people who settlers believe should be upheld and named them after like there's creeks that are named after random families or random people in history that did something supposedly notable like like the the silliest thing is like being the first western doctor in the area when that's like kind of cool but there's been phenomenal doctors that have been here before like since for thousands of years but they don't have like a creek or anything new for them because that's not the way of the Wasainich, like to name places after people. If anything, we name ourselves after the land, like we're the Wasainich people because the name Wasainich comes from our sacred mountain. So we're the people of that area instead of the area being, you know, Hagans or Quadras or whoever it's named after. So there's knowledge about place that's embedded in language, often through names, and which is made invisible when settlers just throw some sailor's name, for example, on that place instead. And that sort of allows people to change the place so thoroughly that the indigenous name hardly even applies anymore. Yeah, and if, if you look around, you can see this everywhere. And, and even when settlers rename areas after natural features, they often just go ahead and transform those places beyond all recognition anyhow. Oh, this is actually one of my ultimate pet peeves. When a building gets put up and they name it after the natural feature that got destroyed in its construction, like calling an apartment complex Oak Meadows or Walnut Grove, when all of those trees are long gone. Yeah, it's, it's really aggravating. And, and the sad thing is that some of those places may never come back. But as long as that memory is still alive and that relationship still holds through the indigenous name and, and through oral history, there is still a chance to restore that sense of place. Like when we did the Daphne removal, I asked the restorationist in charge of the event why we weren't going to plant any native plants after removing the Daphne. And she told me that we actually didn't need to plant anything else right away because she knew that underneath the Daphne, this shallowly rooted invasive species, there were bulbs and roots and seeds of native wildflowers just waiting for the opportunity to return. So in in one sense, these changes to place can be really profound, but in another sense, they can also be so ephemeral. I mean, that's a really beautiful image to have all those seeds and bulbs just waiting under the surface. But as we were discussing earlier with Layla, even though some of these settler names and place relationships are relatively recent and shallowly rooted, people can still be very attached to them and to the cultural legacies and ways of life that they represent. I mean, the the project of settler colonialism has always been to sever indigenous people's connection with land in order to allow settlers to occupy and exploit that land. Renaming these places and forming new place attachments based on settler economies, that's just part of the process. As is, 
climate change. Exactly. So when we're talking about decolonization as a form of climate action, forming attachments to place that don't erase these rich histories, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a messy process. And it's going to require a lot of healing of, of both land and people. I, I guess there's, like, there's this fundamental tension between Robert and Layla's perspectives on place attachment that we talked about earlier, which is I, you can form deep attachments to place and still do tremendous harm to those places and to other people who have relationships with them. Mm. So when Simone asked Sarah about place attachment, she told a story that really drove this point home. So when place attachment was brought up, I immediately thought of our trip to Saturna today. I've never been to Saturna Island, but Sycam and Sayot have ties there. We have a big acreage of land that is owned by these nations. And I'm from Sycam, so I've, I'm part of that. Just FYI, Sycam and Sayut are two of the four Hussainic bands. And Saturna is another one of the southern Gulf Islands, or the Katleges. And it was decided to log a big section of that last year by the people in charge um, of the nations, the leadership. And uh, so, like a lot of community members didn't agree with it. And we, we visited the site today and it was just a devastation. It was a total clear cut of a hundred acres. And you could see for, as far as you can see, there was just no trees, everything was slashed. And it was just like a dead zone. And I've never been to this place. I've never been to this island. I didn't really think about it much until the past few years. And I went there today and I had just like a visceral feeling of loss. Like I felt like part of me was missing from this loss of habitat, this big forest that was old growth. And I just cried because that was the only reaction I could do. And it's never going to be the same because once you disrupt a natural area, invasive species, that's when they strike, that's when they take over. You know, we lost a lot of like medicines and a lot of habitat for not only us, but animals and birds and insects and everything. So I'm just very saddened that that is the young people's legacy that we have to kind of deal with this now. We didn't have the privilege of going to this pristine forest today. We had the opportunity of going to this giant clear cut. So when you say place attachment, I felt it in my, how do you say, salit? I felt it in my body, and salit means soul, that that was our legacy. I don't know, I felt it like in me. I felt loss, like a huge loss, and that I never knew I had in the first place. So it's just interesting when you say place attachment, how I felt it so deeply, and I've never been to this place before. Seeing it that way was extremely sad because that's not how we are. That's not our traditional values. You know, you even when you harvest, you go to the plant and you give an offering of a prayer and you do it in in a good way. You ask permission before you take. You you ask for consent, and then you harvest in a good way. You you don't take more than you need. You you leave some for the birds or for other people, and that was our ways, you know, you respected the land and it would respect you back. It would, it would, it's reciprocal, like Peter said. Um, and then once you start abusing it, that's when it stops giving to you. That's tragic. Yeah, and uh, uh, not, not to single out the First Nations, this kind of clear cutting has been the practice everywhere in the West. and. I'm sure they only made this decision out of dire economic need. It's such a complex issue because the decision to do this clear cut wasn't just a decision to do it, you know. Like, there's so many factors that led up to it. Colonialism, capitalism, traumas, disconnection from the land. You know, it it all adds up to this moment, and it's just so unfortunate that 
that decision was made to take that natural, beautiful, pristine area away. That was probably one of the last natural areas of this area. And the indigenous people made the decision to get rid of it. I, I think just sitting with this moment that Sarah is processing something that we all have to come to terms with eventually. That no matter who we are and where we come from, we're capable of harming the places that we love. I mean, we live in systems of exploitation that make that almost inevitable. Right, yeah. And as she said, there's so much history behind a decision to clear a forest like that. But what really stood out for me from the experience that she describes is that Sarah had never been to this place before. And she still felt this pain and a desire to heal that land without any prior relationship. And it says to me that we don't need to carry forward the same destructive relationships to place of people that came before us. We can choose to take a more restorative path. It's our land, it is our land. And as indigenous youth and just the community in general, we can band together and fix it, plant, restore. You know, there's, there's opportunities. So it could be a teaching tool in the future. And that's the kind of spirit of what I think people came away with from these courses. This attachment to place, even though it can be fraught, might be the best common ground that we have to work from, even with folks who are very different from ourselves. Here's Josephine again. You know, we've finally found um, common ground to share. The people who are most concerned about, you know, climate change and, and making climate action to affect climate change are our people and those are the you know those are our allies and then those are the people that are going to help make us uh, help us to execute our beliefs and our um, values and, and help breathe them help us to breathe them into life um, and so we need to uh, work together and, and do good work together you feel like we can make a difference that way I think it's the only way to make a difference um, and I think it's all us as First Nations people has ever wanted is to be able to to um, honor our beliefs and our laws and those beliefs and laws support climate action and, and what non-First Nations people are calling for. And now is the time to act together and like this gives us a, that space to find each other and also to show others that we can like what we can do if we work together. So the way that I've come to see it, place attachment might be both our best chance to confront the climate crisis and also our greatest cause for concern, depending on the nature of that attachment. The good news is that, according to Layla and Robert, climate positive place attachment can be learned. Yeah, my thought about that is that a person, even if a person's only lived for a short period of time in a, in a place which could be associated with less, lower levels of climate action, one can be more mindful about the place that one lives in, even if one's only lived there a short period of time. Pay attention to that place. Asking people that have lived in a place for a long time, asking, you know, elders and parents and others who know a place well, what has changed and getting them to reflect on that. And then those stories can then help younger generations learn about how things were and how things are now. And uh, that could serve as a kind of substitute for having lived there for a long time. More mindfulness now equals longer life in a place. That's definitely encouraging. I mean, as a settler who's moved around a lot, that's basically what I've got to work with. And I want to play you one more bit of tape that I found really moving. It's from a young participant named Lael Rathje, who took one of the courses and was sitting in on the conversation between Simone, Peter, and Sarah. 
She grew up here in the Salish Sea, and like me, lives on an island that is a neighbor to Sedaeus. Um, it's been very, very inspiring to listen to Sarah and Peter talk about this, and to be able to listen to the Wasanich elders speak on so many important things. I feel like more than anything, this this course, this it's um, taught me to not feel so guilty about being here. Um, as soon as I was old enough to understand what had happened here, I just I've never felt quite right being here. I feel like I I was intruding, even though I was born here. So it's it's I think being able to meet everyone and learn from them and learn ways to to fix things or at least to help in that way it's it's connected me more with my home again in a way i haven't really felt connected since i was very young oh i am honestly really impressed by the the sheer quantity of hope that you've been able to squeeze out of this conversation. That episode on Hope Punk really turned things around for me, you know? Nice. Well, I'm glad. So the bright spot here is that people are actually open to reevaluating and changing their relationship to place, especially if they realize that their understanding of that place is incomplete and maybe even causing harm to other people and the climate. Yeah, and that investing in that relationship can also be a profoundly healing and enriching experience, even though it can be painful sometimes. I guess I guess the question for me around all of these dragons of sunk costs is kind of a choice of what emotional and financial investments it's time to finally let go of and what we should be looking to invest in going forward. Yeah, what, what to nurture and what to let go of. What, what kind of change to embrace and what kind to resist. And that's a perfect segue to our next and final chapter of Scales of Change. This has been Chapter 6 of Scales of Change, a field guide to the dragons of climate inaction. We'll be back next week with our next and final chapter, a form of life. Scales of Change is a production of Future Ecologies, with support from the University of Victoria. In this chapter, you heard Robert Gifford, Layla Scannell, Josephine Henry, Nadia Nowak, Eric Pelkey, Peter Underwood, Sarah Jim, Lael Rathjay, myself, Adam Huggins, and me, Mendel Skolsky. Huge thanks to Simone Miller for going out into the field and getting us that good tape. Special thanks also to Paul Petrie, Sarah Jim, Suzanne Ahern, Anne McLaurin, Andrzej Kozlowski, and all the elders and participants who spoke with Simone and I on Sedeus, but that we couldn't include here, including Cililia, Belinda Claxton, Sasatan, Earl Claxton Jr., Judith Lynn Arney, and Ty Swallow. Besides discovering the dragons of inaction, Robert Gifford is literally the author of the textbook, Environmental Psychology, Principles and Practice. Layla Scannell is a Banting postdoctoral fellow at Royal Rhodes University. Josephine Henry is a Hwasanich Indigenous Language Revitalization student. You can follow her on Twitter at Hwasanich Josephine. Nadia Nowak is a climate activist who grew up on Sedeus. Eric Pelkey is a hereditary chief of Seut, of the Hwasanich First Nation. You can follow him on Twitter at Pelkey underscore Eric. Peter Underwood is a Hwasanich student of Indigenous Studies at the University of Victoria. Sarah Jim is a Hwasanich visual artist and restorationist with the Sneakwith Resiliency Project. You can find her incredible artwork at sarahjimstudio.com. And Lael Rathjay is a climate activist and youth member of the Salt Spring Island Transition Town Board. To learn more about the Tletleches Climate Action Project, visit www.sgicommunityresources.ca slash climate dash action dash project. Our theme song for this series is by Lom Zoku. 
Other music in this episode was produced by Radium88, Bleer Moon, Ben Hamilton, Dust Motes, and Sunfish Moonlight. You can tweet at us or follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Future Ecologies. To learn more about each one of the dragons of inaction, including silly things like the Latin names that we gave them, go to futureecologies.net slash dragons. And if you want to support the work that we do, join our community at patreon.com slash futureecologies. Thanks for listening. See you next week.